Great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's certainly a, a pleasure to be here. I've, uh, I've been here at Aspatar for the last three days, uh, and it's been a very enjoyable visit. Um, I just want to start off with, with a little bit of, about my background. So um, this ATC right here is, is for athletic training, and athletic training is a, a clinical profession in, in the United States that's very similar to sports physiotherapy, um, but uh, it's a four-year degree that, that specializes in uh, prevention and rehabilitation and, and assessment of athletic-related injuries and, and illnesses. So um, that's my clinical background, and then you know, for more of the scientific background, um, I have a PhD in, in kinesiology and, and basically do applied sports medicine research. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of my funding sources for uh, information that we're going to present here today. And then uh, also uh, acknowledge a uh, large cadre of research collaborators as well. Certainly the original research we're gonna present here today uh, requires a big team, um, lots of uh, athletic trainers, physical therapists, uh, physicians, and, and others. So we've already heard uh, a, a fair amount about the, the etiology of lateral ankle sprains and uh, this notion of the inversion and the, the internal rotation being uh, critical to causing the injury to the, the lateral ankle ligaments. Um, we also know through some biomechanical modeling studies that the more plantar flexed and, and inverted the foot is at initial contact, um, the m increases the likelihood of a sprain. So at some point we've gotta be thinking about actually the position at which the foot hits the ground um, is largely going to dictate um, whether or not an ankle sprain occurs or not. When we think about what creates a, a stable joint, whether it's the ankle or, or any of the other large joints, there's really three things that contribute to that. So we've got the bony stability, um, how well do the, the bones fit together, and uh, you know, I think Rod gave a, a great overview of this before, that a, a loaded ankle joint is very stable. Um, but an unloaded ankle joint, so when you're not in, in full weight bearing, that's where the, the greater reliance is going to be on, on the ligaments. So certainly the ligaments are going to contribute as well in terms of providing passive stability and, uh, and holding the bones uh, together and not letting them go too far apart. But then we also have our muscles and tendons, tendons which when you contract the muscles, uh, you can create uh, tension in the tendons that cross the ankle joint and uh, that can increase stiffness uh, about the joint as well. But this isn't a, a purely passive system. We have to also think about the neural components as well. And we certainly know that the ligaments have a large sensory component to joint stability and that there are proprioceptor, uh, proprioceptive uh, sensory receptors within the, the ligaments and they're gonna provide a, a large amount of information about the position of the ankle joint and the movement of the ankle joint um, to the central nervous system. And usually we think about this as being a, a feedback system so that if we get information coming from the, the ligament that the um, ankle joint is moving into a potentially dangerous position, we usually think that, well, then the central nervous system will send an efferent response back over to the, the muscles and tendons, and that will increase the stiffness about the joint in, in a protective way. But, but as Rod mentioned earlier, there are some uh, limitations in that system in terms of how fast it can work to actually prevent uh, an injury from happening. But the other thing we have to remember from a sensory perspective as well is that the muscles and tendons also have sensory receptors. So the muscle spindles uh, provide information about um, the force and length and tension within a muscle, and then we also have the Golgi tendon organs as well. And what this actually gives us is a feed forward component to joint stability as well. So it's not just a feedback system, there's also feed forward mechanisms as well. And when we think about it from a, a physiological standpoint about how the, the somatosensory system works, we've got receptors in the skin, in the joint capsule and the ligaments, and in the muscles and tendons as well. And they're all providing information into the, the central nervous system. And we can then have responses out of the central nervous system through the alpha motor neurons, which contract the extrafusal fibers, which are, are basically the contractile fibers of, of the muscle. But then we can also get response through the gamma motor neuron, which are going to influence the intrafusal fibers, which are those muscle fibers around the muscle spindles. So we see that down here, we have that feed forward 
mechanism. Now, if we look at what we know about the neurophysiology of joint injury, especially as it relates to the ankle, we know that there is a disruption of the sensory information coming from the periphery so that the proprioceptors in the, the ligaments and the joint capsule as well as the, the muscle spindles are sending different information to the central nervous system after joint injury. And then that's going to tie in, because the muscle spindles are involved, we're going to have a disruption of the, the gamma motor neuron system as well. And if you think about the notion of muscle spasm after joint injury, that's being regulated down here through this, this bottom uh, loop. And then additionally, we have dysfunction of the extrafusal fibers, right? We, we have a ligamentous injury which results in muscle shutdown. So we have multiple places within the, um, the nervous system that we have dysfunction in response to a, a joint injury. And one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, well, where do we intervene, okay? Do we need to intervene at each one of these dysfunctional places, or does one intervention actually reset the whole system. And, and you know, I think we would argue that if all we do up here is work on strength, that it's not going to reset the proprioceptive deficit. So we probably need to, to take a more multi-directional uh, approach to doing that. Another way to, to think about this is if you look at each one of these boxes across here, and I'm not going to read them all out to you, but each one of those boxes, you can go into the ankle sprain and ankle instability literature and find anywhere from a handful to dozens of articles in each box that show that there are deficits in these sensory motor or biomechanical measures in people either as they recover from acute ankle sprain or who have chronic ankle instability. And one of the questions that we, we need to ask is, again, we know that all these deficits exist. Are they, how related are they to each other? Do we need to develop um, treatment strategies to address each and every one of these? Or can we address uh, some of them, for example, postural control? We know that if we do balance training, we can make postural control better. Does that carry over into the more active uh, tasks like gait and jumping and landing and cutting? and vice versa, does it go the other way? Or do we need to treat all the way along this spectrum here? Mechanical instability, certainly in, the, in terms of laxity, complicates this issue. Um, and uh, we need to keep that uh, in mind as we develop our, our treatment goals. So I want to focus today uh, in this first talk on postural control, and, th and then I'll come back later today and, and talk about gait. Um, but in terms of postural control, we know that people who have poor balance, okay, are at an increased risk of um, suffering ankle sprain. And this has been, been shown in, in young people, in, in adolescents. And you know, the, the, the question here is, well, why does that happen? I mean, it, it, is it something just about, well, they're uncoordinated, so they can't balance, and thus they're at a greater risk of, of injury? Or is there actually something you know, more subtle about the way their sensory motor system works to be able to protect joints in the lower uh, extremity. The other thing that, that we've been able to show is that prophylactic balance training. So if we do balance training from a, uh, a prophylactic sense, that, that can reduce the, the risk of, of uh, sustaining ankle sprain. And this was a, a systematic review that we did back here, and actually uh, some of Dr. Barr's uh, work was uh, original research was included in that systematic review. But but we feel that that you know we have this notion that there's a relationship between poor balance and ankle sprain risk, and that if you can improve balance, you can actually reduce the risk of ankle sprain. So when we measure balance in, in our lab, we, we use a, a modified Romberg position where they're standing on one foot on the force plate. We usually put their arms across their uh, chest, and we give them the instruction to stand as, as still as possible. We will manipulate vision, so we'll do some testing with the eyes open other testing with the, the eyes closed. Um, and what the force plate gives us is this thing here called a stabilogram, which is a, a representation of the center of pressure. And the center of pressure is, is basically, if you could think about standing on, on one limb, that if you had a stylus that went through the foot at the, the point of the, the central application of force, 
within the foot. And then as you try to maintain single limb stance, you're going to sway back and forth, and that center of pressure moves. So what we look at is the, the velocity of the, the center of pressure with the idea that the faster that that moves around, the less stable someone is. And the slower that the, the velocity is, the more stable uh, that it is. So we're going to go through some, some studies here. So this first study, what we did is we just wanted to look at people after acute ankle sprain. Um, so we tested them within 72 hours uh, after a grade one or grade two uh, lateral ankle sprain. And what we're going to find here is that the, the green represents the, the limb that was sprained, and the pink represents the contralateral uninjured limb. And we tested them as quick as we could after injury, um, oftentimes within a day after injury, two weeks later and four weeks later. And what we noticed is that on, on the injured limb, there was a marked improvement or reduction in the center of pressure velocity over the month after ankle sprain. But there was also a marked improvement in the uninjured limb as well. So again, this was the limb that was not injured. So th this brings up some, some interesting possibilities. So one is the possibility that there's a, a learning effect. We serially test them on the same task over and over, and perhaps they, they just get better at it. Um, an alternative explanation is that maybe we actually have bilateral motor control deficits after unilateral joint injury. So in that case, what, what we need is we actually need the point before they got injured. So what we did um, is we, we pre-tested about 400 uh, college athletes across a wide variety of sports um, at, at a US university. And, and we basically waited for them to sprain their ankles. And we repeated the, this study, but now we actually had data before that. So what we have is at baseline or a preseason measure, there's no difference b between the limbs side to side here. But then what we have is they, they injure the limb right here. And you can see that what happens in response to the injury is that we actually get a, a bilateral detriment of postural control after unilateral ankle sprain. So this tells us that there has to be a central nervous system mediation of uh, motor control after a unilateral injury. Now, over the course of a month after injury, the uninjured side returned to normal quicker. Okay, so what can we blame this on? You know, could it be pain? Could it be swelling? Um, those types of, of things. But uh, it, it really opens up this notion that we have a central nervous system problem in response to ankle sprain. If we go to a, our group that we call chronic ankle instability, so these are people who have repetitive ankle sprains. They uh, complain about their ankle giving way or they feel like their ankle's gonna give way uh, during uh, functional activities. And they've had problems for, for over a year since their, their first sprain. In this case, we're gonna use a, a different measurement technique called time to boundary, which just picks up more, more subtle deficits in chronic ankle instability. But we, again, measured people with unilateral chronic ankle instability. So they have one side that they've sprained many times. They have problems that affects uh, th their activity. And on the other side, they've never sprained that ankle. And then we compare them to healthy people who've never sprained either ankle. And in this case, um, we're actually going to have the, the, the case that higher values are, are better for these time to boundary measures. And what we see in these people with unilateral chronic ankle instability, they all present with bilateral deficits on these different postural control measures. So again, even though they only have one limb that they continually sprain their ankle on, they have poor balance on both sides. Well, we want to go into that and, and, and look a little bit more deeper about, well, how do they actually differ in their, their balance? So we can say they have worse balance, but, but how do they accomplish that? So in this case, what, what we do is we, we look at that, that center of pressure uh, distribution, and we say, well, how does that relate in relation to the quadrants of the foot? So if we have an anterior medial, anterior lateral, posterior medial, and posterior lateral, quadrants of the foot, what we find is that people with chronic ankle instability tend to distribute their pressure during a single limb stance more anterior and lateral than healthy people. In healthy people without history of ankle sprain, most of their center of pressure 
uh, distribution is in the posterior medial aspect of their foot. But in people with chronic ankle instability, it shifts to more of an anterior lateral projection. I want you to think about that. As you stand on, on one foot, how could you end up putting more pressure in the anterior lateral quadrants of the foot. And there, there's really two possibilities. From an anterior perspective, you could dorsiflex your ankle more. And the more dorsiflex you are, you're gonna move your center of pressure up front. Well, one of the things about dorsiflexion of the ankle is that's the closed pack position of the ankle. That's the most stable position. So if your ligaments and your muscles aren't providing the stability, you can do it with your, your bones. You can adjust the position of the bones to get more stable. The other way you can shift things more laterally in the ankle is to supinate your foot, okay? And by supinating your foot, you put the subtalar joint in the closed pack position, the more stable position. Now, there's a paradox there, though, because if you shift the weight of your foot more laterally, you push it towards inversion, okay? So you're actually ending up with a coping strategy that's creating more stability by using the bony stability, but it's pushing you in the direction that the, the injury happens. The other thing that, that we've identified as, as a mechanism for postural differences is uh, modulation of, of the Huffman reflex. And the Huffman reflex basically, uh, or H reflex, t tells us how much of a muscle's motor neuron pool is available. So not necessarily how many motor units uh, are contracted, but how many are available for, for contraction? And when we go through normal activities, we have natural muscle inhibition. We very rarely use all of our motor neuron pool to do a task. So if I wanted to reach down and type keys on my computer right here, I certainly don't use all of the available motor units in my arm, or I would knock the computer over and, uh, and not be able to do any fine motor skills. So we, we down-regulate or, or we control the, uh, how many motor units are available to contract to do more subtle or, or fine motor tasks. So one of the things that, that we know is that as we change positions from a, a very simple posture that requires virtually no motor control of the, the pronus longus or the soleus in a prone position is actually when our H reflex is highest. That's when we have the most motor neuron units available. When we go to standing on two feet, we have less. So there's a down regulation in how much of the motor unit is available, of the motor uh, neuron pool is available. And when we go to single limb stance, it goes down even more. So what we wanted to do is to say, do the people with chronic ankle instability down regulate the same as healthy people. And what we find is that in both the, the soleus muscle, and then the next slide I'll show the, the pronus longus, the chronically unstable ankle does not downregulate as much as they shift from a prone to a bipedal stance. And then again, when we go to the bipedal to unipedal stance, we have less down regulation. So we see this central nervous system problem in the way that motor units are uh, controlled from an inhibition standpoint, both in the soleus and in the uh, peroneus longus. Okay, those tests are all great, but they, they don't help the, the clinician very well. So from a clinical sense, we use what, what we have called the star excursion balance test or, or the Y balance test which is a balance and, and reach test. And we basically have them balancing and, and reaching. So we're actually testing the limb that stays on the ground, the stance limb. And the farther they can reach, okay, and you can see this is very slow and controlled movement, the farther they can reach, the better dynamic balance we have. Um, so this allows us for a nice clinical test that we can chart people's progress um, over time. And again, interestingly with, with this test, if we have a big side-to-side -side difference, it's also been shown to be uh, an increase in the, the risk of, of ankle sprain. Again, if we go back to our chronic ankle instability group, unilateral instability, people reach less far compared to their contralateral limb that they've never sprained, and they reach less far than a healthy control group. So we can pick up differences here, and we can also monitor progress to, to rehabilitation.
Um, one of the interesting things we note is why do people with ankle instability reach less far? Um, it's not because of less motion at the ankle. It's actually because they don't flex their knee and their hip as much. So that tells us that, that there's probably some proximal uh, muscle inhibition that's happening as well. And in response to the ankle sprain injury, they're still not uh, able to use their hip flexors and their, or their hip extensors and their knee extensors as well to control the amount of flexion that they get in that uh, extremity. So when we look at this, we, we see that in the involved limb in somebody who has ankle instability, we've got local sensory dysfunction, we've got proximal afferent dysfunction, that's happening at the spinal level of motor control as well as the supraspinal level of motor control. And we see that on the efferent side in the involved limb, and we also see it on the efferent side over here. So as we look at this and say, well, how do we intervene from a, a rehabilitation standpoint? We've got all these different possibilities for how we can use different parts of the somatosensory system uh, and the, the neuromuscular system to, to intervene. And you know, it's not just as simple as saying, well, your ankle's hurt, we need to just work on your ankle. We need to be thinking about those bilateral deficits that are being regulated within the central nervous system. And we need to be thinking over here that it's not just a, a strength issue at the ankle, but that it, it involves distal and proximal joints and the other limb as well. So I'm gonna finish up the, this talk by presenting uh, a balanced training program that, that we used on people with chronic ankle instability. And uh, basically this was a, uh, a four week balanced training program uh, done three times a week, uh, supervised sessions. And uh, we're doing a, a series of exercises to make things more difficult. So we start with the single limb stance with eyes open. We go from firm surfaces to foam surfaces. We change the position of their arms. We can also start throwing things at them to create kind of those dual processing uh, type uh, issues that, uh, that Rod talked about earlier. Another group of exercises that we're gonna do is single limb stance with eyes closed. So again, we'll start them on a firm surface and progress to an unstable surface. We can change their arm position so it's harder to balance with your arms in tight at your side, but with their eyes closed, we do not throw anything at them. Then we get them the moving some more. We, we do some hop to stabilization. So we're asking them to hop and then maintain their balance. And we're doing this front to back, side to side, and diagonal motions as well. And we increase the distance uh, of their hops as we go. And then we take this a step further and say hop and stabilize, and now reach back to where you came from. Okay, so then hop back to where you started, stabilize, and reach where you came from. And then we increase the, the distance of those hops as, uh, as they improve throughout the rehabilitation process. The last thing we do is we do some unanticipated uh, hopping tasks. So down on the ground here, there's, there's nine uh, pieces of tape that each have a number on that corresponds to a, a phone keypad. And they're watching the computer screen right here. And the computer screen is gonna bring up a different number and they don't know what number is coming. So this is an unanticipated uh, movement that they have to do now, as opposed to before all the exercises were planned, they knew what was coming. We advance this, each time they come in, there's a different number sequence, and as they get better, the numbers come faster and, and faster. So you know what we're able to show here, so we have a control group, so the control group here represents people with chronic ankle instability who did not do the rehabilitation program. The balance training program was, was, uh, uh, did the protocol we just showed there. If we look at self-reported function in terms of their activities of daily living, we see a dramatic increase in the balance training group after four weeks. If we look at their uh, self-reported function in sporting activities, we also get a, a dramatic increase there. If we look at the dynamic balance, that we have with the star excursion balance test, we see um, substantial increases in their dynamic balance uh, capabilities. If we take a look at their static postural control, so measuring this on the force plate, again, we get dramatic increases in um, how they're controlling their posture. 
And one other thing, if we come back and say, well, how are they doing in terms of where they're maintaining their center of pressure during single limb stance, we find that they're, they move post rehab to more of a posterior lateral representation. So you'll remember the healthy people were over here on the anterior medial side. So after rehabilitation though, we see that we do move posteriorly, which again tells us that they're probably not dorsiflexing as much to maintain their single limb stance. They're moving back into a more loose pack position and the muscles are starting to take over the, the maintenance of uh, postural stability. So you know, just to conclude, we can identify that poor balance is a predictor of uh, increased ankle sprain risk. In the presence of unilateral ankle sprain, we have bilateral postural control deficits. So there are definitely central nervous system changes that are happening. And then if we do rehabilitation focusing on balance training, it improves the, the clinical outcomes in patients recovering from both acute ankle sprain and chronic ankle instability. Thank you very much. Thank you.